the big exclusive interview of the day, uh, Ruchir Sharma in conversation with Shireen Bhan. Welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and my guest today is one of the most influential voices on the global economy, the world in 2017 with Ruchir Sharma. Ruchir, many thanks for joining us Great and congratulations here. because the rise and fall of nations has made it to the most popular list in the business category uh, on Amazon.in. Well, thanks so much. Uh, um, this book meant a lot to me because it was really putting together 20 years of research in terms of 20 years of learning about what are the different factors that drive different countries politically, economically, geographically. Um, so to see this come this way through and for this to be the best-selling book in India this year in the um, non-fiction space means a lot to me. So thanks for that. Well, uh, let's start by talking about India then, right. Richard, And then we'll talk about the rest of the world and where you see markets headed. But in terms of India, the biggest factor to deal with at this point in time <laughs> is the big D word, demonetization. Right. Right. Now, you've been fairly critical. You believe that this kind of therapy was not justified. You also believe that if you look at the cash to GDP ratio, then it's not outrageously high at 12% of GDP for India. In fact, you believe it's comparable to other uh, economies like China, Thailand, etc. You've said that uh, revenge cannot be a development <laughs> strategy and India cannot leapfrog in that sense uh, by using demonetization as the route. But do you believe that there are, uh, do you buy any of the economic arguments that the government is presenting that yes, there will be short term pain, but in the long term, this structurally changes the India story? No, I don't see the economic argument for this. I think that the debate has now shifted that whether there's any political benefit to this. Uh, because I think that uh, a lot of people in India have been surprised, uh, at least outside observers, by, by how well India has coped with this. Now, this is a huge step to be done in a non-crisis environment. Because usually, these kind of measures are taken when a country is going through some major crisis, uh, a financial crisis, some inflation crisis. but. Like this step has been taken outside of a crisis environment, and I think that the, the I think that most people in private will tell you, whether it's the government or business people, that they don't really see any any enduring economic benefit of this. The, the best case that I've heard about this is that this was a lot of pain for nothing, which is that you got uh, a lot of pain, but the enduring benefit will not really be there from an economic standpoint. Everyone now is debating. When will this economy get back to some sort of normalcy? Because I've been meeting a lot of business people in the last couple of days. I've been in India, and the common number I've heard from everyone is down 30%, yes. which is that roughly, if you look at all the sort of evidence in terms of sales or other things, or whether it's advertising, retail, et cetera, the most common number I've heard is that things are down about 30% from a year ago this month. Mm -hmm. So December is really the pinch month for this. And I think that most people agree that the benefits of this, you know, people spoke about a fiscal windfall, other yes. things. I think most people now come to the conclusion that none of that will be there. Mm -hmm. But the debate now is shifted to politics, which is that, is there some political benefit to this? Do you uh, believe that there will be political benefit? I think it's too early to say. And I think that this is where we are really in uncharted territory because I, I had come to believe that in India over the last uh, couple of decades, the political paradigm had shifted. That in this country now, good economics was good politics, mm. right? That, which, that if you sort of delivered on very high economic growth, low inflation, you would get elected. If you didn't, you would get booted out, like the previous government got booted out. Uh, so UPA won one on the back of, I think, a very good economic track record for growth and inflation. UPA two with a disaster in terms of uh, growth and in, uh, coming and corruption. off. And, and inflation, corruption, like other factors, but really growth, inflation, you know, just yeah. uh, stick to the basics and it got. So I thought that that was working at a state level as well, that, you know, different states that we traveled to, that was working. I'm not sure what's going on in India today, mm. which is that because this is such an emotive issue, it's like almost like saying we want to end terrorism. Who can argue against that? We want to end black money. We want to end uh, um, corruption we, like we want to. But my experience having traveled to different countries is the fact that it is very difficult to end these things uh, in such a manner, that these things are done more organically over time. Mm. There's not a single developing country I go to where corruption is not a major issue. Mm. Um, like two weeks ago, I was in Mexico, and it was very interesting what was going on out there. Mm. In Mexico today, the single biggest factor which anyone will speak to you about is corruption, mm. about you know, corruption like the political system. But here's what happened. In the year 2000, they introduced uh, state funding of mm. elections. Now, as you know, there's, uh, there's a big talk about that Absolutely. in India too, yeah. that listen, yeah. the next follow-up step needs to be state funding of, of elections. So Mexico, feeding up at least political funding. Yeah, but in terms of, uh, but this is one of the solutions to yeah. that, which I've heard about. 
But here's the problem with this. So like in Mexico, they introduced that in the year 2000. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, because they were close to the United States, that's what we should do, have state funding and free television uh, space to all the political parties. 16 years later today, they think that corruption is way higher in the political system than it was when they first introduced this. Okay. So that to me is the, is the point that these uh, symptoms of a very high uh, share of uh, a parallel economy, uh, very high use of cash uh, in the economy, or things like basic stuff like co corruption, these are the unfortunate plights I feel that many developing countries suffer from. And it's only as they get richer that you, or, or more prosperous mm -hmm. that you find that these tra uh, traits sort of come off, you know, which is that you begin to move to a more normal environment. And this is my case as far as India is concerned, that we're at a very basic level of economic development. Our per capita income is just $2,000. At this level of development, all we have to do is to follow the best practices of what other countries have done to have gotten uh, less poor and more prosperous. We don't have to reinvent the wheel out here. That is something for economies at the technological frontier to try and do that, to come up with new things, like, like in the United States or other economies. They have to spend a lot on research and development to come up with new things, to, you know, um, because they've already reached a very high level of development. At our level of development, we don't have to do this. We just have to basically stick to the basics and get those basics correct. And I think that the real problem, which I think that, um, that we face from, is that we tend to be quite insular. Mm. Like last decade, I felt that one of the biggest mistakes that policymakers made in India was to confuse a global boom with a local boom. Mm that all emerging markets were booming and the rising tide lifted everybody and we thought that uh, something special was going on here where really it was a global boom which was lifting us. Mm -hmm. Similarly out here, these type of experiments, whether it's demonetization or other things, are being carried out in other countries, political funding uh, for, of elections. All we have to do is to basically look at what other countries are doing mm -hmm. and what the global trends are. Mm -hmm. The other thing which I found very fascinating is that this decade, the amount of cash being used in the global economy has in fact gone up. Mm -hmm. Right? So now you think that the entire global well, economy is moving, moving towards... To less cash. Exactly. Yeah. Less cash or digitization, etc. But this decade, the amount of cash being used in the global economy has moved up significantly in many countries. Mm. Like in countries like Japan, in fact, the cash or the share of the economy is 20%. Right? So yeah, like we're at 12, we're at the other extreme of, of 20%. Um, and my point here is that why is this happening? Mm. So Japan's a classic case. When you have very low interest rates, or the real interest rates are virtually nothing or negative, and there's less faith in the banking system, people tend to keep more cash. Yeah. And that's what's happened in Japan as well. You've seen a, such a surge mm. in cash take place. Now, corruption, I don't find that much of a relationship with that. Japan is hardly a corrupt society at 20% cash as a share of the economy. Similarly, Pakistan's cash as a share of the economy is less than ours at less than 12. I don't think Pakistan is a less corrupt state than you know what India is. Mm. So I think that this is about sort of just uh, learning and incorporating what other countries are doing mm. and following those examples. So if you're, if you're less insular and, mm. uh, and, and use other templates in terms of what's going on, I think the results for us will be better. But I think now it's, you know, like this has happened. There's no yeah. point sort of going on about this. Absolutely. It's time to move on, yes. right? In, in, in terms of what are the next big issues that we need to deal with? What is the next big stuff? And here I again find that what is happening in the United States today um, with the new... Uh, uh, president out there, the implications of that are very significant, including for India. Some okay, I'll, I'll come to that in just a second, yeah. but I just want to, you know, end the, the demonetization <laughs> conversation okay. because, you, you know, the, oh, yeah. just, just, just right. another sure. couple of minutes. Uh, you know, the evidence at this point in time on the actual impact on the economy is largely anecdotal. Yes. So, you know, you talked about 30% is what you're hearing. Yes. As, as, as that's the common refrain when you talk to businesses in India. But what do you think will be the implications for the GDP in, in the short term? Uh, and, you know, do you believe that this is going to be more than two quarters? Is this going to be a protracted slowdown that we should brace ourselves for? What is your own sense? Because there is no precedent, yeah, uh, you know, to, to, to talk about. So therefore, it's very hard to predict because even the GDP data, as you know, is like wacky data. Yeah. For example, someone told me that, in fact, that because the number of deposits in the uh, system has increased furiously, that, in fact, will help uh, show it an increase in GDP growth because the financial sector will show that the GDP growth has picked up significantly because the number of deposits has gone up significantly. So I think that just looking at GDP data, this is, you know, that's very quirky. Mm. So I don't think that we're going to see the effects of that. My hope is that India is a very resilient economy, that, that, that it's able to withstand lots of shocks. Our, it goes back to my original point that our level of development is very basic, so we are able to withstand these shocks in, and we move on. 
The problem, though, I think is that people haven't adjusted expectations much. I was having, for example, speaking to my team here about what the earnings expectations yeah. of the market are. And I find that, like, staggeringly high. Like, people have barely cut back their earnings uh, for, uh, for this fiscal year. They're still expecting 10, 11% type of growth, even though the first half was like 3 or 4 or something. And for next year, they expect 18% growth mm. in like earnings. Mm. So I think the problem so in you India has that to do with, realistic. I mean, like, I just, you know, like, it just seems very high because so much economic disruption going on. Some of it is even justified, you know, expecting GST, et cetera, to come. And it seems as if this move basically, for now at least, mm. has killed a lot of animal spirits in the economy. Because yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of traders are sort of feeling that they've been labeled as just being crooks mm. uh, in terms of this. And, and a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future. Mm. So I think this has killed a lot of animal spirits in the economy. But I think that to forecast what the exact path sure. of this will be, nobody knows. So I think that, so therefore even uh, on the marketplace, we're seeing complete confusion. There's complete yeah. lack of activity, right?